Hey, y'all, I'm Shane Sams. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast today. And thank you for joining me every single week as I interview some of the best experts, authors, and entrepreneurs on the planet Earth. I love having conversations with people out there doing great things, making big things happen, people who have gone out there and been successful. But I also love to talk to people, man, who have had failures, who have pulled themselves out of the fire, dusted themselves off, and then took their success to the next level. I've got a good buddy of mine that says, if you've got an entrepreneur that ain't failed, you better get out of the way because it's coming. (laughs) Because failure is part of the journey as we are all trying to do big things and grow our businesses. And I've got a super inspiring story of a guy who got successful, failed, and then came back and succeeded at a higher level. My guest today is my good friend, Pedro Adeo. You know, it's funny when you're in online business, man, you kind of like start uh, your circle starts reaching out and you start getting that Kevin Bacon game going where it's like, how many degrees of separation am I from Kevin Bacon? Well, it's kind of like that online. You'll see online entrepreneurs, people doing webinars, people doing seminars, people doing challenges, people doing all these things out there. You'll meet some friends of theirs. You'll add each other on Facebook and then your Facebook friends, but it might be a couple of years before you actually hang out and meet. You're just connected by all these different things. And over the last couple of years, I've noticed that I got more and more connected to Pedro Adeo and his amazing brand. We have some similar mentors. We've got some similar friends, but we never got a chance to hang out together. But I loved what he was doing with funnels. I loved what he was doing with challenges. And before I got to be Pedro's friend, I was a big fan. Then a couple months ago, I was speaking down in Dallas, Texas. We were in this arena. We had 8,000 people. I was coming off of an illness. Didn't even know if I was going to be at this event. I was actually looking up at the stage thinking, am I going to walk up there and pass out and fall off of that stage? And then I felt someone grab my shoulder. It was the owner of the event. His name is Joe Johnson. And I looked beside him and right there beside him was Pedro Adeo. As many of you know, I'm a Christian. This was a Christian conference and through mutual connections, Pedro had been there at the event. And right before we went out, Joe and Pedro prayed for me. And it was a really cool moment. Went up there, did my talk. Everything went perfect. And then when I came off the stage, got to go backstage to uh, grab some food and hang out. And I was hanging out with Pedro at catering, looked up, and I swear we had been sitting there for like two, three hours talking about business, talking about life, but it felt like two minutes. And I said, man, you have got to come on my podcast. I've got to introduce you to my audience. So on today's Shane Sam show, we're going to talk about finding the faith to go it on your own. How do you get unstuck? How do you get out of the rat race? How do you break all those patterns and beliefs and all that programming in your past so that you can truly step out into your destiny? Pedro is going to tell us an amazing story that's going to warn us about the danger of shortcuts. As you get successful, as you start to grow, there is a temptation for entrepreneurs, business owners, coaches to go out there and try to push that gas pedal all the way down and succeed as fast as possible. But one of those shortcuts actually put Pedro into a $3 million hole. And it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. That's part of the journey. But we're trying to avoid that catastrophic failure, people. So Pedro is going to tell us that story, teach us how to avoid those major, huge failures in our life. And then we're going to talk a little bit about something that most entrepreneur business podcasts don't talk about. And that's how the past can derail your future. And you know, if we got Pedro Adeo on the show, we're going to be talking about challenges. We're going to talk about challenges and how challenges can be used to grow your business. This was an amazing conversation from an amazing man. I can't wait for you to listen to it. I know it's going to be a blessing and it's going to help you grow too. So whether you're on your commute, driving to work, maybe you're on a treadmill, taking a walk, Heck, you could be sitting in a chair, sipping on a cup of coffee or a mason jar of sweet tea. Wherever you are at, turn up the volume and enjoy the show. Three, two, one. Pedro Adeo, my friend. How are you doing, brother? Shane, my man. Happy I'm, to looking be here, at that horse, I'm looking at that horse painting back there behind you. That is some sick art. The back to your back left. What do you think about painting? That? Right. What do you that think is that? gorgeous. What I'm does that mean? Kentucky, man. What does that speaking to you? What's that saying to you, Shane? You know, it says, uh, you know, it's like it's like it looks like, it's like roaring through like a fire. It feels like it's came through a bad situation, but it's better for it. And it's just like charging forward, which is like, yes. I don't know, man. It just drew my eyes. That's what it is. That's what, that's what it is, bro. That's 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 a horse ran through the fire. That that is me right there, my friend. I love that painting. I now live in Southern California. I used to live in Northern California. It was part of an awesome church up there. And this church had a, a prophetic 
painter, prophetic artist. What that means is um, she would maybe sometimes she would just have a, a white canvas on the altar. And during the worship time, she would just literally have no idea what she would paint and just hear from God. And then just that that is actually finger painted with what? no brush finger paints with Crayola, the cheapest Crayola like type of paint you can get at like um you are store. kidding y'all no. y'all gotta go watch a youtube video of this one you gotta see this painting yeah no it's insane right. and i have a bunch of these and you can't see i got a, I got a bunch more that, that's a four by four that's four feet by four feet sometimes she has no idea what she's gonna do and just she hears from god and does it right there other times she kind of has an, a thought but that painting was painted live with during a worship set about 45 minutes with fingers wow and, and um does she and yeah, give man, it to the people in the crowd then like whoever she thinks needs that painting or nah, well, well i just i'm like hey i'm how much you know like if i if i like it i want it and this painting spoke to me like this is this painting is what you saw bro like you know my story bro i came through some i came through just a, a fire a, you know a really tough season about seven eight years ago and uh you're exactly right man i've seen god do amazing things and and uh you know, my favorite verse is Romans 8, 28. All things work for the good to those who love God are called according to his purpose. And and so that painting just, it just fires me up, man. Like no pun intended. It just reminds me of what kind of what God's done in my life these last seven, eight years. And now I feel like I'm helping a lot of people. And so are you, bro. Like what we do, we're, this is to me is also reminds me there's a lot of other people who are still in the fire and need our help. Need our help to put a few things together and help them you out. You got to reach back and pull them out sometimes, man. That's, That's the same oh, yeah, thing. Of course. Yeah, and God God puts it on your heart to do it, dude. The uh, tap, t- let's talk, let's go let's go back to that, man. Let's go back seven eight years ago. Tell me a little bit about your story before you became uh, Pedro Deo, before you became the guy, the number one challenge guy on the planet, man. <laughs> like like take take me back there. Like what was that like uh, before the entrepreneurship journey? Maybe before the fi- like what was the fire and yeah, you know, just fill in the audience a little bit about what you went through. Yeah, I mean, all right. So to make it super quick, like. Um, my parents are immigrants. They came here from Portugal. So I grew up in the Bay Area, Northern California, um, raised by two uh, Portuguese immigrants. Very, you know, kind of old school. It was like, go to, you know, get good grades, go to college, get a good job. So, you know, I was a good kid, got good grades. I was, you know, I was a musician. I was a t- tennis player. Like, so childhood was awesome. I did great in school. I was, I was, I was just winning in, in different things. And I went to college, you see Davis, went pre-med, decided that wasn't for me, got an econ degree, got engaged at 19, uh, got married, I graduated college, got married, bought a house, 22, okay? Then I just started cl- climbing the corporate ladder. I've always been hungry, Shane. Like I've always just been hungry to learn and grow and, and I've always been ambitious, you know? Um, so then, where the story kind of really shifts is I'm 28 years old and now I'm kind of getting bored with, I'm getting bored with uh, just the corporate deal kind of getting, you know, sick and tired of the commute driving to work, you know, three you hours. Mean it wasn't what you, it wasn't what everyone told you growing up. You get, I mean, you get a job in the corporate world and everything will be okay. It I mean, it was, like, <laughs> come on. I mean, it was, it was okay, but like, I don't, it's good. Enough. Really feel, it's good yeah. Enough, right? I mean, I'm, I've never been that kind of guy that's just okay with okay. Um, and so three hours in the car, I got, a, I got a young family. I find there's no purpose with my job. I'm like, I mean, like they're paying me decent money there. I was making over six figures, like, I don't know, 18 years ago and benefits and all that stuff. And I'm like, this work feels like purposeless, meaningless to me. Like, I don't, you know, and so that's happening the commute and I just wanted to make more money. I felt like I was capped. So I started this, I started a side hustle. Um, I got introduced to the real estate industry from a good friend of mine who was a mortgage broker. I, I became an appraiser, a real estate agent, a real estate broker. And while I was working full time, I started a side hustle doing appraisals and selling houses. Um, my side business, I, I was working evenings and weekends, still a full time job and commuting. Now I'm making more money part time than I'm making full time. Mm. and it's taking all of my time. I'm barely, I, I drive to work, but I'm barely working. Cause I'm like, I'm going to leave my cubicle, take calls, putting deals together in the parking lot. So eventually I was like, dude, I but can't, the lines are starting to blur. A little I'm bit. like, this is yeah, not really fair. Bad. You know, 
Yeah. And you know, funny story, I drove to work for six months with the intention, the last six months of my corporate career, I drove to work every single day of those last six months, Shane, fully intending on quitting that day. Really? I drove to work. I'm quitting today. I'm quitting. Like it was costing me money at this point because I'm losing deals because of this job. Yeah. I'm driving to work. Okay. Like this makes no sense. I'm going to quit today. Uh, you know, okay. Well, you know, it's almost lunch. I'll wait till after lunch. Uh, day's almost over. I'll do it tomorrow. Shane, I, this programming from my parents who love me, who care about me, yeah, this programming of security in your job, the 401k, the pension, like it was so hardwired, even though I, with my own eyes and my own hands, I saw I was prospering and doing way better on my own. It, it, I chickened out six months in a row, Shane. Dude, so like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause like, not only, I mean, I had all the same thing, go to school, get a job growing up. Um, I was a school teacher for 10 years, the safest of the safest of the safe jobs. You get tenure, they can't fire you, yeah. whatever. We realize in like 2013 that we can quit our job around like June, May, probably May. Really? We knew we could quit our job. Right. Cause um, we were, everything was going up. July was like 15,000 in a single month. August was $36,000 in a single month online. And we started, and I, me and Jocelyn started having this conversation and we were both like total fear, like total panic. And like, it was like, what do we do if we need something this, and what if, what if that, what if, and we had just made more money in a single month than we made as in a year as a school mm -hmm. teacher. And yet we were still frozen, hesitant yeah. to walk in there and resign. And it's crazy how that just gets in your brain. We're just taught that way, right? And when we see something that's not normal happening in our life, it's like our brain can't even process like what's happening, right? Can't we just do them both? It'll be safer that way. But like, what's what's good with safer? You know what I'm saying? Well, and we did them both. Uh, guys, we used wisdom. You use wisdom too. We we kept our day jobs. We launched we our side hustle. Past wisdom. Yeah. But, but some people want to quit their job and they got no plan. They have no, yeah, that's not good. No way. That's just not wisdom. You're going to, especially if you're the, if you're, if you're, if you are the main breadwinner, right? Like your family's counting on you. You know, I had a pipeline of business. I had saved one whole year's worth of expenses. So I had like 12 months, I had a 12 month emergency fund. If I didn't close a deal for six months, nine months, 10 months, I'm like, well, I guess I got, I, I, I was, I never was worried about not being able to get another job. Now, the irony is when I quit my job, our company was laying off people. Mm. So that made it even more of a mental, mental warfare. Like I'm giving up a job and I have friends of mine being laid off. Yeah. Like I'm giving up my job when I have friends who would die to have their job back. So that, but my dad actually gave me a key. My dad's very old school and I just want it. I, you know, I, naturally we want our dad, you know, our dad's approval, our dad's permission. We're kind of hardwired to please our fathers. And I, there's another reason why I think we have that, that, but I wanted my dad to give me the green light. Tell me, okay, son, I think you can quit. I think it's yes, son. I agree with you. I think it's time to quit your job. And I was just, that's probably where I was waiting so long. With him. And then my dad, who's not my dad, who's old school, very rough. I would say not, incredibly self-aware and doesn't have a lot of the great communication tools that we have today. Yeah. He said, Hey, stop asking me to tell you it's okay to do something that I would never do myself. Oh, wow. Dude. Like, was this in conversation on the phone or were on you the guys phone. together? Wow. No, on the phone. I can tell you I was in my master bedroom. That was one of the deepest things my dad ever said. And my dad's not this super deep guy. My dad is like very old school, black and white. And when I realized that I was asking my dad to give me permission to, to be an entrepreneur, how I was asking my dad to give me something he did not have to give me. My dad wow. never had the faith or the courage to be an entrepreneur. He didn't have the desire to be an entrepreneur. He had never he had the background so, to grow, grow into that. Maybe yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. My parents, they came here with nothing. So they had to, so, so my dad was so, so, um, appreciate him having the wisdom in that moment and set me free. 
The other thing that has a big part of the story is hey, you know what my you know what my dad said to me was <laughs> my dad uh, how many kids you got? How many kids you got? Three. You got three. You got girls? I can't remember if you got girls. I got a girl in the middle. Boy, girl, yeah, boy, girl, boy. There's five of us brothers. It's so funny. My dad's kind of old school. I, I, every time we talk, I realize how parallel some of our background is. Yeah. And like my dad one time told me uh, I was having a girl and like there's no girls. Like it's just all boys in our family. And he just looked at me and went, I was like, what do you think, dad, about this? Me having a girl. What do you think I should do? How's it going? He goes, Shane, this is one place in your life. I cannot help you. And he just walked away and got his car and went to his office. And he said, I'm done, man. I can't do it. Smart, and, uh, it's funny, though. Just, like, once you get to that point where uh, that was kind of I think that was the moment where I was like, oh, I don't have to yeah. run everything by my dad forever and ever. Yeah. Amen. You yeah. know, and that's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah. And then here's the other turning point. About this time, I started watching Joel Osteen on television. So I was born and raised Catholic, you know, Portuguese family, nominal Catholics. We, I really, we weren't on fire for God. We just kind of went to church once in a while, checked the box, Christmas, Is Easter. after you had quit your job? After no, you it was before. It's before. Oh, before. So I'm born and raised Catholic. I was going to church once in a while, um, not really pursuing God, but just, I, you know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to church a couple times a year, but not really, not really growing in my, I wasn't on any faith journey or growing in that. So about, but, but now for some reason I start watching Joel Osteen in the morning. I start like, so now like God's kind of wooing me with Joel. And now Joel Osteen was the first person I ever saw talk about spiritual things that wasn't a priest. Mm. Yeah. I was like, well, wait a minute. How come, how come this guy's talking about God and he's wearing a suit and he has a wife and he has kids. I thought I tried to be a priest to, to really pursue God. And so I'm watching this for six months. And then the turning point was a close friend of ours in the, in the Portuguese community in the Bay area. She got sick in her late twenties and ended up, uh, she, she, she battled breast cancer, uh, three times. The first time she it came, she, she beat it, came back again. She beat it a second time. But the third time she was just tired, kind of worn out and didn't really want to fight anymore. And she was about, she, she was, she was on her final days. And this is like worst case. And she's like 20, I think in her late twenties, late, young, late twenties. She has two babies, two kids, maybe like five and seven at the time. So I go to visit her and say my condolences to the fam, to him, the husband. So I get to his house and there's all these cars there, all these cars, man, everywhere. And I assumed it was our, our tight knit Portuguese community that was there. I walk in the door. I don't recognize anybody. I'm like, Hey, is Joe here? They're like, Hey, he's upstairs. So I go and talk to Joe. I'm like, Joe, oh my God, I'm so sorry, man. I can't, you know, I'm just getting my, my, I'm just sympath up, you know? And then I'm like, Joe, who are all these people? I mean, there's people doing laundry. There was people in the kitchen making food. There's people doing homework with the kids. There's people walking around praying and there's people like, I never seen so many people helping. And, and I, and he said, Oh, this is my church family. Oh, wow. I'm like, what's a church family? <laughs> right. He, he goes, well, these are my friends from church. I'm like, your friends from church do your laundry. I'm, I'm thinking like, this is so strange to me. So I'm, con I'm, I'm, I'm confused about why people from church would be here at your house, cooking for you, cleaning for you, helping with your kids. Like then I walk into the room and I see this lady who's on her deathbed about to widow her, a young husband about to not be able to raise her own kids that are little like this is kind of like worst case scenario i would imagine and i'm you know by the time i got there her eyes were closed and shane it's the craziest experience every time i talk about it i just get goosebumps like i'm looking at this lady and all i can all i can see and all i can feel is this peace this insane peace like i don't want to get weird but i felt like she was kind of just glowing i mean i don't i'm not trying to get weird and new agey but like I, my memory as i recall as i think about this it just felt like there was like just all this light coming from her and she was still alive and i just felt this insane i just saw this insane peace on this lady who's about to die and widow a young husband not raise her kids and i and i'm like what is going on here like why what is this? How, I get, how do I get some of that peace? Well, let me tell you right, what happened. Like in the words, yeah, man. So that's what happened. I get on the. I, I'm coming home. 
I call my wife on my on my I call my wife on my Motorola flip phone. On my Motorola StarTech flip phone. Okay, that's all. <laughs> right. I'm like 28 years old now, I think. I said, babe, I don't know what I just saw. But here's what I can tell you. If it was you dying and I was going to be a widow, have to raise these kids by myself, I would want all the help that I saw Joe have. And if it was me dying, I want that peace. So I don't know what this is, but if it's ever offered to me, I'm going to say yes. She ends up dying a few days later. I go to her service. Her pastor does the service, gives an altar call. I got saved at a funeral, bro, at 28 years old. Wow. 28 years old. I get saved at a funeral. I buy my first Bible. I show up at church that week. I respond again to the altar call to make sure it was real. Put my hand up again. Went to the front. Got saved again. Okay. Did you go to their church or did yeah, you go their to church. your church? Yeah, the, no, their oh, church. They you. had a church. I was going to the. I went to their church, and then got plugged in. And here's the here's the whole point of the story. I do not believe I would have had enough faith to walk off my job mm. had it not been for my decision as a grown up, twenty eight, to be born again, to pursue God. I was. I, I, I jumped into the men's Bible study. We were doing purpose driven life. Rick Warren. And I remember on the tape or on the DVD or the CD, something, it said, if you've got too much on your plate, it's because you're trying to do more than what God has for you. Mm. And that just gave me the permission to trust the Lord, walk away from my job. Bro, I've never looked back since I was 18 some odd years ago. No, 18 years ago. And uh, and then we just had nothing but success. Grew, 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 grew. Then through a series of poor decisions, I, I just, um, I just, I wanted to get involved with bigger deals. I wanted to get to get there a little faster, do bigger deals. And so, so you went all in on real estate, though, right all after, in, right? Bro. This is all in on real estate, like just trying we to grow this thing it. as fast as possible. We were killing yeah. it, and then I got into financial planning, and I was killing it doing life insurance and 401ks and investment property. Like it was just success, 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 success. Then. I, I met, I started hanging out with, with, with some people that were doing different stuff, um, investing in, in, um, in, in, in notes, buying paper at notes, buying yep. loans, knew nothing about this. And yet the returns looked so in, insane that I just kind of got duped. I bought the story. Um, I did my due diligence the best. Why, I could. why do you, why do you think you, you know, this is always fascinating to me, like, you know, and as I've gone through different layers of entrepreneurship, there's yeah. always this temptation to get off the path a little bit and like oh, yeah. start doing different things. And I, and I, thank God I have my wife who balances me out and she's like in the business every day with me because I would be doing crazy stuff too. Like, but like, why do you think that was it? The paper looked easier than the other real estate. Was it the returns exactly. look great? Was it greed? What was it that made you? I can tell you exactly what it was that way. You know, I can tell you exactly what it was. Exactly. Um, first of all, I was, I was in a hurry. I was on the path to wealth. Mm. Like I was on the path to wealth. I saw a path that appeared to be a shortcut to get there faster. Mm. And why, why was I in the big rush to get there faster, Shane, to get my dad's approval. Mm. My dad loves me. I know he loves me. He was a very good father. He would soccer games, tennis matches. Like my dad was a very present involved dad. He, but he just did not know how to tell me he loved me. He did not, he didn't tell me he was proud of me. He kind of withheld that affirmation. And his thought process was he wanted me to keep trying harder. He didn't know it was just gutting me. Right. So literally I'm a grown man taking insane levels of risk, putting my family and myself at risk not knowing it was all just to crush it, create mega millions in my, you know, in my thirties. And my dad would be like, wow, son, you did it. I'm so proud of you. Like I had like this movie fairy tale ending and what, and so that I I, I say, so I had heart wounds, Shane, I had heart wounds, uh, specifically father wounds. And when you have heart wounds, those create blind spots. So even, so the reason why I was able to be duped, I don't blame those men. Those men are who those men are. 
they were they're sharks. They were sharks, yeah. and they were and. But it's my fault I was due because I wanted to believe their lies. My wife saw through it. And I was like, no, babe, you're just a hater. You're being negative. This is, this is how God wants to prosper and promote us. I, I, I'm, I was moving not in faith. I was moving in presumption. Very, very dangerous. I, did, I didn't want to see the red flags because I wanted to believe in this. And, um, and so I could tell you, like, so much of how I teach and train people how to be an entrepreneur today and prosper is just by avoiding some of those catastrophic mistakes I made. Yeah, it, I ended up $3 million in the hole in wow. debt to friends. I ended up in debt to friends and family members, people that I grew up with and I knew loved me and I loved them were close friends, became foes, bitter enemies, lied about me, made false claims about me. It was the worst crushing I've ever experienced. And here's the biggest part of the biggest problem, Shane. I had never failed at anything in my life until yeah, I know how to do it. it. Yeah. So I never knew I didn't know failure. I was used to being the smart guy, the money guy, Pedro's the man. Pedro, I let people put me on pedestals. Here's a writer downer. If you let people put you on a pedestal, you're giving them permission to tear you down whenever mm. they want to. So now yeah, listen to that. Come no, on I don't let anybody. This is why Jesus, this is why Jesus is so brilliant. He's like, Hey, I don't, I don't take praise from men. Yeah. He said that I don't take praise. You guys love the praise. You guys love to praise you Pharisees. You guys love to praise each other. He's like, I don't even, I don't, I don't take any praise from men, Right. Because with the minute you let men and women and praise you, put you on pedestals, those same people who built you up will tear you down and have no problem doing it. And the teardown is a hundred times more painful than the buildup. So I, I, I am the, yeah. one of the things in my, my background, like that always stress, like before I became an entrepreneur, I was a football coach. That's what I did. I, I taught and coached football, but it's funny. Like I, as an assistant, like I kind of rocketed up the ranks. So like, I was like, a, I was an assistant at a high school. And then all of a sudden I was an assistant at a college, West Virginia university. And like I'd done all these things, and then I got um, the first year I ever tried to be a head coach as a high school head coach, I got a high school head coaching job. So I'm like on this high. Yeah. And my first year, I went 0 and 10, and I lost every game. And I am so thankful for that experience before money was on the line. I am so glad that I got to experience brutal, like you know, in a small town in the south uh, football and basketball or everything right so mm -hmm. like to to go to church oh and 10 to go to work oh and 10 ever to see you oh and 10 in the newspaper that everybody's reading was the yeah. greatest preparation i could have ever had when i actually got to start making money because i knew what failure really tasted like we all have experienced failure in our entrepreneur journey for sure but that context helps me i think see some things good or bad like in, like if i'm going too far pushing to being too high on myself i can yeah. look in the mirror and go bro you could be zero and 10 next season you better get your stuff right son you know so what, what's the message here don't try to avoid failure you know like obviously i'm not saying fail on purpose but use wisdom get counsel do the best you can I do think entrepreneurs can avoid catastrophic failure. Of course, like they once can. You, that that's where, where I think people like put some people take that failure mentality a little too far. Like it's okay to fail, but with wisdom, you can fail and recorrect and get on the get yeah. everything going faster again. You know I didn't I mean? have to fail at that level. I mean, Shane, you said a key. You talked about your wife. I was not listening to my wife at all. Like always a bad idea. Even though she, that's just dumb. Like how dumb is that? Like. She's my helpmate. Like, this is the person that God gave me to help me. And I'm literally now not listening to her repeated counsel to big, big, I'm like, well, babe, why? Tell me why. And she could not explain it to me. She didn't, she couldn't give me the facts and the figures. And, and because she couldn't explain to me why she didn't think this was a good idea, because in the, in the natural, all the facts lined up. So, yes, there's ways to avoid catastrophic failure. But the point is that, hey, if you're going to fall, it's better to fall out of a, out of a one story window than falling out of a 10 story window. Right. And so, uh, unfortunately, like when I fell, it was, that. it was from a very high place. 
And that's why it took me so long to recover. But man, from there, God has done like, I got, I, I got $3 million dollars is like a 30 story building. That, that Yeah, bro. It felt like a hundred stories. I wanted to die, bro. Like I, t- I'm very <laughs> open about this. I, I, w- I was too chicken to kill myself. Like I was not going to do that because I was mostly too scared, but I, I sincerely wanted to die. I felt like my life was over. I felt like I had nothing good to offer anybody. Look at this big mess I made. I didn't, I saw no way to clean it up. I saw no way to really fix it and clean it up. And um, we went through just a season of having to just get all, just fix all that, clean it all up, just work through, un, just work through the using wisdom and just to, to honor the best we could to kind of dissolve that situation. Yeah. And then it got back to my field of favor, got back to the insurance industry, got back to where I always had favor, which, which was in the insurance industry and, and doing things for, for myself. How does this turn eventually to online business? Like, where's the turn? Yeah. So you climb out of this hole. So I'm a financial planner. Hole, yeah. And like, wh- where does it turn to online? I get back into financial services. I get back into my field of favor. And then um, I was doing events. I was doing, I was doing, um, I was doing direct mail dinner seminars. I was inviting people to a seminar direct mail, come to a free steak dinner here, learn about retirement planning options. was doing well with that, but I'm like, this is silly. It's 2016. Like we've got the internet, we've got Facebook, we got funnels. I was always curious about marketing and I was learning about marketing. I just wrote a book. The Lord said that God, I felt like God told me to write a book. So I wrote the book and then I launched my, I relaunched my entire business around this book and totally online using a sales funnel and Facebook ads. And I began inviting people to a meet the author night, meet the author night, uh, retirement education events. That's how I learned funnels. That's how I learned Facebook advertising. Um, had my first seven figure year ever, ever, ever. Um, literally within, within three years of my lowest low, I had my highest high, Within three years of thinking I was worthless, wanted to die. I was back in the biggest and best home we ever had in our life. And I just had my first seven figure year as an entrepreneur ever within three years right. of wanting to, to give it all away to like literally not. Yeah. Um, and then, and then God tricked me into teaching uh, in May and June of 2018. God tricked me into doing a free masterclass teaching what I call kingdom entrepreneurship and, and, you know, kind of how I've, how I've applied kingdom principles to my business and, and um, it was supposed to be a 30 day project, kind of just a little fun passion project. So it was the book, the book though, was it, the book was like financial stuff, financial, right? Yeah. It's yeah called so this, is a total, this is a total, this is a really huge kind of pivot then like the yeah. kingdom entrepreneurship, all of this. I, yeah, yeah. I had nothing. I wasn't, I didn't have a course built didn't have a book. I was not trying to be, I was not trying to be Pedro, Mr. 100 X. I was, I had vision to go build a monster financial planning empire. But then I start t- 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 teaching on the kingdom, teaching on entrepreneurship and the kingdom and my story and, and how to actually use kingdom biblical principles to prosper and grow in favor and business and marketplace. And I'm, t- I'm actually didn't know this, but I was equipping the saints. I'm actually equipping people who love God, who want to make kingdom impact, but just don't feel called to vocational church ministry. That's right. And but I'm like, guys, like, that's great. I love my pastor. There's a role for vocational full-time people in the church mountain, but that's like 1% of people. The rest of us should just be focused on being the best we can be at what we do in the market and just glorify God by being amazing at what we do, solving problems, serving people at scale. And so, you know, we, we started talking about that. There was immediate favor on it. People wanted to keep it going. I'm like, well, okay. So I launched a membership. Uh, hello, I launched a, you know, I launched a 995 annual membership. I'm like, all right, guys, well, I'll just keep teaching you stuff, but I don't have a course. I have nothing. No, like I'll just keep going. They said, sure. So that was almost four years ago. Now it's over a over hundred nations. Um, I've trained probably close to 400,000 right, people. Um, I, I yeah. grew that business doing challenges. Then I became known as a challenge guy. And now I've gotten to work with Dean Graziosi, Damon John, um, you know, some of the big, you know, Ryan Dice, digital marketer. I mean, literally the who's who of internet marketing came banging on my door to learn how to do challenges my way. 
Yeah, yeah. And, um, That's how I first heard of you was through the challenge stuff. I knew you more from challenges before I ever knew you were a kingdom entrepreneur. You had the book, you had the live event experience, had the seminar type experience stuff, uh, translated that well online. But like, why did you plant your, well, I guess you got your flag planted for you in challenges because people wanted to know what you were doing. Right. Why did you decide to use challenges in the beginning to grow well, this thing? The first thing I did was this, I did a, I did a 30 day free masterclass. Oh, gotcha. Which a masterclass, my, I kind of just evolved the masterclass into this challenge. So it's all, it was just, I did it. It worked. I kept, I just kept working. I kept doing it. Like challenges are so much easier to have success with, in my opinion, than a lead magnet, than a webinar funnel. I mean, to me, it's the simplest, easiest, most straightforward marketing framework. It's built on kingdom principles that will never change. And it worked with, it's, it's just, it's, we, I mean, I was successful with my very first masterclass when I wasn't even trying to sell anything. I had nothing for yeah. sale and it, it crushed it. So I just kept doing them over and over and over. We've, today we've done over 60 challenges in the last three and a half years. No one's done more challenges. No one's done more than, than, than we've done. And, and we're the only company that I'm aware of um, that actually has full-blown curriculum, training, coaching, workshops on how to crush it with challenges. So that's our that's my profit center. That's my, that's not an overtly Christian brand uh, or crush it with challenges uh, business. And then I've got hundred X, which is for our overtly Christian, you know, kingdom minded people. Yeah. The, uh, the challenges, um, you know, just at a high level, like, you know, this, one of the debates, like, cause I've got a lot of friends who do different things and challenges and all sorts of stuff. And like the debate I always hear is between like short challenges or long challenges, like, <laughs> the 30 day challenges versus get the challenge over within a week, just so you can get them to the sale. Yeah. And like, do you got an opinion on that? Cause being, you know, like, what do you think is better yeah. for the sale or the client, man? They both work. I've made, I've made millions of dollars uh, with the five, with five day challenges. I've made millions of dollars with 31 day challenges. Mm. Um, it, it all depends on you as the entrepreneur, how much gas you got in the gas tank. It depends yeah. on the topic of the challenge. The challenge should really be just only as long as it needs to be to deliver on the promise of the challenge. Right. So, so if it's a longer challenge, do you find it's a, like it's a higher ticket at the end of it? Maybe there's a big promise. You're getting a real big result for 30 days. You know, like when you do a two day seminar, it's because we sell higher ticket stuff. If I do a one hour webinar, I'm not going to be able to sell the same thing at the end. Right. So do you find the same thing there with that challenge? You could, but that's not usually what I do. I sell the same thing on the back of a 30 to one day challenge as I do on the back of a five day challenge. Right. Um, it just, it's just a different type of campaign. Uh, but you could, obviously the thought being the more, the more you serve them, the more they know who you are, the more time you've spent together, then they're, you know, the better, the better a shot you have at getting them into a higher ticket product. But um, it really comes down to what, what, what outcome you want to produce and, and how long is it going to take? So my wisdom I mean, challenge. When you say challenge, you always mean live, right? Like always you know, these live. challenges are done live. Yep, always yeah. live. I have friends of mine that have cracked the code on Evergreen. Yeah. Um, I have I have not I have not ventured out to Evergreen just yet because we just do so well at live. And I'm you know, everyone's looking at me, everyone's modeling, copying what I do. And I just don't want people to think that I want people to try doing a live challenge first, get good at it before they ever think about evergreen. Well, listen, Pedro, man, what a great conversation, man. Your story is fascinating, dude. And I'm like blessed, man. Me and Pedro, we ran into each other. I, I was uh, coming off of a big illness, getting ready to go out on stage. And I look back and I see uh, Joe Johnson, who owns this live event company, and Pedro Adeo, and they prayed for me right before I went out on stage. And then me and Pedro got lost in the at catering for about three hours. <laughs> I just jammed. And uh, I just knew I had to have you on my podcast, man. Uh, real quick before we go, tell everybody uh, out there where they can find you online. Probably just at uh, pedroadeo.com, my main website. They can kind of go or they can force, they can follow me on Instagram at Pedro M. Adeo. All right, y'all. That wraps up my interview with Pedro Adeo. Make sure you check out everything he is doing, both in his challenges and in the kingdom entrepreneurship stuff he's got going on online over at pedroadeo.com. 
And if you would like to become an entrepreneur, if you'd like to start, build, or grow an online business, you got to have that online business built so you can use the challenges to grow it. That's exactly what we do over at my company, FlippedLifestyle.com. At FlippedLifestyle.com, we help people start, build, and grow online businesses of their own. We help people replace their income, take control of their financial future, and build wealth online so they can create an inheritance for their children's children. We would love to help you do the same. We believe that everybody has God-given skills, talents, abilities, things you love, things you have learned, things you have lived through, that wisdom that Pedro talked about today that you can use to start, build, and grow an online business of your own. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could earn your entire income online like I do, like Pedro does, and like so many people are doing today? We believe you can do it, and we know we can show you how. And you can actually start your online business journey right now for free. All you have to do is go over to FlippedLifestyle.com. That's F-L-I-P-P-E-D, Lifestyle.com, slash free. And we've got a ton of free resources there that'll help you find your ideas idea for an online business, research that idea to make sure it can make money online, and then take your next steps into turning that into an income for your family. Again, that's flippedlifestyle.com, F-L-I-P-P-E-D, lifestyle.com slash free. Go there and start your online business journey today. All right, y'all, that is all the time we have for this week's Shane Sam Show. Thank you so much for listening. Hey, if you love this podcast, could you do me a favor? Go give this a share on social media. And then go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Tell us what you think about the show. I read all of those reviews personally, and I would love to see what you think. Subscribe and download a bunch of episodes so you've got them whenever you're out running around. And hey, don't forget, if you love this show, go listen to the Flipped Lifestyle Podcast. That is my other podcast where I interview and coach real members of the Flipped Lifestyle community live on air every single week and let everyone listen in so they can learn how to change their family's future as well. That's all the time we have for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time, be consistent, be prolific, be relentless in whatever it is you are doing. Pick your stone up, cast it out upon the waters and cause many ripples. I'll see you next time.